Hello guys and welcome to the Marigold Standard, your weekly audio source of all things Dream Star Fighting Marigold. I am your host, Rob Goodwin, and I am joined by perhaps the world's most exhausted man. It's Matt Turner. Matt Turner, are you surviving, my friend? I am, my friend, and I had a, a heck of a weekend. So first and foremost, as we're recording this, it is the 27th of May, which here in the States, it is Memorial Day. And Memorial Day is a day we remember the men and women of uh, our country that had the ultimate sacrifice, that have given us the ultimate sacrifice for the freedoms we get to live. And I do, do want to say for any men or women that are uh, part of our military past, present, and future, I thank you for the freedoms that we get to enjoy every single day. But yes, my friend, it was uh, it was an exhausting day yesterday, as I told you, as we were um, right before we hit the record button. On Sundays is my side job uh, at the uh, restaurant that I work at, and it's a holiday weekend, so it's going to be busy. We've been short on they've been we've been short on help for ten years. The one girl who pretty much runs everything, her mother was having surgery, so she wasn't there. So uh, instead of having somebody else come in, it was pretty much uh, just me and my one boss running an entire restaurant for about 10 hours you throw in the heat my friend and uh yeah it was a, uh, it was an exhausting day but that that's you know it, it, i get tapped on the shoulder this is what you need to do i go and do it and uh and that's that but uh, it's nice that i have today off for memorial day and then tomorrow i'm off as well we have a little family trip to hershey park which should be fun but uh, no brother all is well i am doing fantastic i'm excited to talk about these two terrific shows from Marigold. But how is everything on your end, brother? Yeah, not too bad. Um, uh, things are coming together slowly but surely um, in the new house, which is good. We've been out with Kirsty's parents tonight for uh, for a lovely meal. And obviously with us uh, doing the Marigold standard tonight, I had to uh, indulge a couple of pints of um, Thatcher's Gold just to stay on brand as well, so I'm uh, I'm raring to go. Um, but yes, we are going to be talking about the two shows from the 26th of May at Shinkiba First Ring, uh, the opening of the grand opening wars from Marigold. We've got a little bit of news to talk about, both from the world of Marigold and from the world of Stardom. We've got some cards announced for both the 1st and the 2nd of June and indeed for Marigold's next foray into Corican Hall, which will be on the 11th of June. Some really, really, really tasty matchups heading into that with one in particular really, really catching my eye. Um, and then, of course, we have got um, our interview with Sonny Gutierrez, which we will be recording later this week. So if you have got any questions for Sonny, then please let us know in the comments. We've already got a load on Twitter. So if you want to add yourselves to Ooh, that queue of questions, then please feel free. Of course, just bear in mind that there might be something that he is not at liberty to answer. Um, so if you're wondering why Mayu Iwatani has not jumped to Marigold, he's obviously not going to be able to answer that. But anything about the uh, the backstage workings of Marigold or, you know, some road stories from the world of stardom, um, I'm sure he'd be more than happy to answer because I'm, for one, Matt, I'm very, very excited to talk to him about uh, some of the little nuggets from his uh, from his nine years in stardom. Yeah, I'm sure that once we get going on, a, so I didn't write down any topics or anything like that. I know we've had a lot of really great, great questions from our fantastic listeners of the Stardom Cast and the Marigold Standard or the Marigold Experience. The Marigold whatever Experience. One you want to go to. Come on, if you're going to do it, do it properly, my friend. <laughs> oh, you experienced Jimi Hendrix. But I know that I once we get into like one thing, like maybe like a rib like tan plate on a Zoom, I know it, I'm just going to go down a rabbit hole of certain things. So no, I'm really looking forward to it. Sonny, you know, we've mentioned on the show a handful of times over the last year or so, has been nothing but super helpful. Um, even so when it came to the enunciation of certain, some of the stardom wrestlers about two years ago where we didn't seek him out. He basically just said, hey, guys, I love the podcast. Some of the enunciations are a little bit off. Here's how it's going to take time. Here's how I would help you out enunciating. So Sonny has been absolutely nothing but fantastic to uh, to both me and you. I know that you reached out to him a handful of times on your new book, and he was nothing but grateful and gracious to you. So super excited for what is hopefully one of many interviews with uh, one Sonny. Um, Rob, now I know this is not the AEW podcast, but I was just wondering, did you by chance catch any of Double or Nothing last night? I will be honest, Mr. Turner, um, between painting 
unpacking um, uh, and watching both the Stardom and the Marigold shows, I have just about managed to find time to eat and breathe. So no, tonight is my uh, my double or nothing night. So uh, I'll let you know how it goes. I hope you enjoy it. There's some matches that I kind of, again, when I came home last night from my insanely long day that I, I didn't catch because I caught the inside of my eyelids. But it was kind <laughs> of funny. I'm not going to spoil anything for you. I was kind of funny as I, I think I woke up right at the end, at the end of the Orange Cassidy match. And I happened to wake up as uh, Adam Copeland was coming out to Slayer south of the heaven. So far be it from <laughs> me to wake up from a deep sleep by uh, having Slayer being played in my living room at about midnight. But from what I saw, the show was really good. Um, again, not to spoil anything, but I'm sure you've seen it. Somebody got caught on fire in the main event. So, uh, and that was only about seven minutes in. So I'm super excited to hear Jim Cornette's rant on that. But I do have to say, <laughs> from a from a pure, there's a lot of chaos. It is an AEW pay per view, but from a pure wrestling standpoint, probably my favorite match of the show was a uh, former AEW or not, excuse me, for current AEW Women's Champion, but former Stardom world heavyweight champion tony storm had a phenomenal match with serena deeb and we mentioned before how eo is kind of coming into the, her own here and basically having like a low-key women's wrestler of the year to go along with the micas the hazukis and of course the saris and mayu Utamis. you can throw tony storm's name in there as well because she's had some banger matches these last few pay-per-views and of course the timeless uh tony storm character gimmick is really really over so that is one match that again I, it was a it was like a five hour long pay-per-view so you're probably not going to be able to get to all in in one or two days my friend but that would be one match i would definitely go on your way to check out is the fantastic match between one tony storm and one serena deep yeah, it's certainly one that I'll, uh, I'll check out. There's some really tasty matches on there that I am looking forward to seeing, and I'm sure we'll discuss it a little bit on this week's uh, Stardom cast as well. Um, but Matt, I think it's about time we delve into the news. As I mentioned on last week's Stardom cast, the news is not just going to be centric to the promotion that we're talking about, so whether that's Marigold or indeed Stardom, just because we've run the risk then of the news becoming outdated by the time that we're waiting for the next episode of the relevant podcast. So the news will always be just general news, and then obviously the show reviews and the discussion will uh, will revert back to the podcast that we're actually talking about. But in terms of news, obviously there's a couple of big things coming out of Marigold. Unfortunately, starting with some injuries, starting with Julia, who, uh, true to her word, was at both nights of the Shinkiba show um so but tokyo sports has confirmed that julia has undergone surgery on her right wrist um scotty wrestling um put this out on twitter and then julia put out a picture of her in hospital saying i'm fine so it does look like we are on the road to mending that wrist ahead of the summer destiny show on july 13th where of course she'll be fighting against sari um matt fingers crossed that julia is going to be fit for that show however at the moment all things are looking good my friend I like how you said she's not wrestling sorry. You said she's going to be fighting sorry. Because if we know those two styles, it's going to be a little bit of both. But as that match get, gets ramped up, it's going to be more or less a fight, which is right up our alleys. And I'm sure that match will be a uh, match of the year candidate when it happens. But yeah, it looked like that she did not want to have surgery. I know a lot of wrestlers, the last thing they want to do is have surgery. But from what I understand, and from what was reported again by a good friend, uh, one Scotty Wrestling, is that the sur- she was told by the doctors at the surgery, if she does have the surgery, she'll heal up uh, quicker and she'll heal up stronger. So she's probably going to have to just look at the lesser of two evils. But it does look like that if the surgery does go well, which uh, fingers crossed it will, that should be all good to go for that match um, in, in the summer for the Summer Destiny show. Again, sorry. So we wish her well. And she did seem in good spirits, not only on these two shows, but I know we'll cover it later in the week. She was in really, really good spirits for the Hana Kimura tribute show, despite nodding, not being able to compete on any of these shows. So I think uh, I speak for all of us here on the Marigold Standard Experience and the Stardom cast when I say get well and get well soon, Dangerous Queen. Yeah, absolutely. It's um, it was It was a very emotional 
close to uh, the Hannah Kimura tribute show um, with obviously the video package um, outlining that feud between Julia and uh, and Hannah, which unfortunately was obviously one of the last ones in uh, in Hannah Kimura's life. Um, wasn't quite ready for that. I'll be perfectly honest. Was uh, was beautifully done. Was beautifully produced. As as are all the video packages over the memorial shows. But yeah, it was nice to see that even though she wasn't able to compete, she was able to be there. She was able to uh, to pay her respects, which I know that she has been desperate to do um, for the longest time on these shows. So it's nice to see that that was the case. Um, the the image of her and Kyoko Kimura as well was uh, was really really nice. Unfortunately, sticking with injuries, um, Nanai Takahashi was uh, was pulled from this weekend's Marigold shows because she contracted COVID. Um, and now Ishikawa, unfortunately, will be missing the shows on the 1st and 2nd of June. Those are the shows in Osaka and Hamamatsu because it looks like she injured her left knee in one of the matches in Shinkiba. It does look like this is only a precaution and she has been announced for a match at uh, Corrigan Hall on the 11th. So it does look like this is only precautionary, which uh, I'm hoping it is. Um, You know, obviously we don't like anyone being injured, but um, Ishikawa has been a real a real strong shining light in these uh, in these early Marigold shows, someone that I didn't think that I would enjoy as much as I have. Um, so fingers crossed she is able to recover from this injury and uh, she's able to uh, take her rightful place amongst the roster for this Corican show, Matt. Tell you what, Rob. I mean, maybe we're the uh, maybe we're the black cloud. Maybe we're the curse because at the end of you know not the end of last four or five months of uh, of stardom last year, it seemed like everybody was injured especially going into and out of the five-star grand prix now marigold they have their first show it's absolutely fantastic the tag team match that main event uh in cork and hall was terrific julia's injured and then nanai is covid and now and now ishikawa is, is it uh she's injured and it's, again it might be just be, be a precaution but it's like oh geez marigold you, you they thought they hit and well they did they they hit an absolute home run on that first show and they've hit a little few bumps in the road, which I guess tends to happen. But they've done a really good job shaking up the cards, not only from the shows we're about to review, but the shows coming up next week. So, And it's going to give some interesting opportunities for some other wrestlers as they kind of have to shuffle the cards up. So, um, yeah, you never want to see anybody get injured, no matter what sport it is, but especially in the professional wrestling world, especially Marigold, who was off to such a hot, hot start after that first show and a couple of the wrestlers are injured, but uh, hopefully they are back and back soon and better than ever, my friend. Yeah, it's, it's, it's unfortunate. Um, uh, it does feel like everything sort of came at once for Marigold because obviously you had Julia missing uh, the foreseeable up until uh, Rio Goku with a broken wrist. You've got Nanai with COVID. You've got Nai Ush- uh, Nao Ishikawa who was going to be missing the upcoming shows as a precaution. You had Chikagoto missed this weekend's shows with a prior commitment. You've got uh, Koki Amare who was going to be missing next weekend's shows because of a prior commitment. Um, and when you only have a relatively small roster, um, it does sort of, it requires your Marais, your Utamis, your Victoria Yuzukis, your Miku Aonos. It does require them to step up. And even though, you know, we're going to use this term like we do on the Stardom cast, you know, even though they were house shows, so to speak, at Shinky, but I still think there was some standout performances. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, everyone stepped up. Um, hopefully, of course, Nanai should be fit um, by this weekend. Um, you know, COVID willing. Hopefully, Naya Ishikawa will be back as well by the Corrigan show as well. So fingers crossed. Obviously, all of these injuries will uh, will prove to be less of an issue. Um, uh, just on Stardom, and we've talked a little bit in, on uh, on the Stardom cast about how sort of lower mid-card wrestlers, and that's a horrible thing to call them, but sort of when you consider it's not your Mayus, it's not your Suris, it's not people like that. Um, But Momo Kogo is going to be wrestling in CMLL, um, which is really, really good for her. We praise the decision to send Hanako to New Japan Pro Wrestling. We've talked about um, Rani Yagami, being chosen to compete in Catch the Wave. And I think it's really, really good to have 
people who wouldn't necessarily have this uh, this exposure being able to go out and uh, and really showcase what they're all about. So June twenty eighth, Momokogo is going to be wrestling in CMLL and Ladies Ring Lucha Fiesta two, um, and that is going to be on the twenty eighth of June. Like I say, against Amapola. So uh, hopefully, if uh, if Stardom World reset as it is recently, is anything to go by. That will be on Stardom World, fingers crossed, for us all to watch. And uh, just on that note, we talked last week that Aya Sakura was going to be going to Diana to take on Nanami. And uh, that match is already on uh, Stardom World to stream. And that's really quite a good turnaround considering the match was only on the 25th. Matt, I assume you haven't quite had a chance to watch this yet due to your horrendous amount of sleep deprivation and work schedule and the like. No, but literally, and I think I texted you right when we were getting ready to start, just so we can confirm the time, is that as soon as we get off this podcast, I'm going to watch the stardom show that was live yesterday and, excuse me, and that match. So no, I haven't seen it yet, but I'm going to get caught up on all stardoms because all things stardom once we get off this show, because I'm really looking forward to all the insanely, uh, all the insane booking stuff from KBS Hall that the fine folks over at Stardom are booking, because it's going to be, and I'm excited for me and you to talk about on the Stardom cast later this week, because there's a lot of interest. They opened up a lot of avenues, let's just say, for about 94,000 things that happen, and I'm super excited for it. But no, I didn't get a chance to see it. But going back on Momo Kogo, getting a chance in CMLL, one of the biggest wrestling companies you know ever i mean they've been around for a long long time and i think momo will do well there she does a great job connecting with uh the north american audience obviously mexico is part of the continent over here on north america so i know she'll do well there and she does work a lot of the lucha style offense so i think she'll fit in well there and again kudos to you know uh, mr okada saying if it makes sense and there's no barriers and there's no borders, why won't I take somebody like a Momo Kogo and put her over on CMLL? Because there'll be a lot of new eyes on that show, whether it's live or whether it is, um, you know, on later on a video feed or YouTube feed of the, the fine wrestling fans over there in Mexico that have never seen Momo Kogo and that are eyes that'll bring them over to stardom and stardom world. So again, like he said about a month ago, if it makes sense and I can do it, I'm going to do it. So you have Momo Kogo going over there. Aya Sakura working over at Diana. Um, it's all really good stuff. And yes, I um, wouldn't be shocked to see that match pop up on our stardom world feeds within 48, 72 hours of that show happening. So, uh, it just again, just more bang for your buck to get Stardom World because not only do you get these shows, past, present, and future, but you're getting to see these Stardom wrestlers over in different promotions. Like how we I mean, Sai Kamatani in their first round matches of Catch the Wave. So, yeah, super excited for her. For her, obviously, we're huge fans of Momo Kogo, especially her overcoming all the injuries that she's been able to overcome over the last year, year and a half. And the fact that she's going to be competing in a big company like CMLL is just that. Uh, I'm really happy for her. When I saw that pop up on my uh, my Twitter feed this morning, I was really, really happy about it. Despite me being all sorts of exhausted, Rob, I still was able to crack a smile. Well, it's funny you should mention being tired because, Matt, I am going to attempt to blow your mind. Now, it was announced via the We Are Stardom Twitter page that Suri is going to be competing in Seedling um, on the 12th of June as part of a recent Nakajima's retirement road at Shinjuku Face. Um, now, she is going to be part of a match alongside a, a, a real who's who of the Joshi scene at the moment. So Mayuki, he's a part of it. Makoto, obviously a recent Akajima, Veni, Mima Shimoda, uh, Nagisa Nozaki, who we're going to be talking about a little bit later on for her exploits in Marigold, Rini Yamashita, Sukasa Fujimoto, um, Ayomi um, Sasamura, Yuki Masahiro, and Das Chisako. All are going to be taking part in this match. But Matt, it's not your ordinary match. And when it comes with a warning from the We Are Stardom Twitter page that the rules are, and I quote, a little unique, so try and follow, you know that it is going to be a complex series of events. So let me just go through these rules. Now, I know that there are going to be people out there who are a damn sight more focused and uh, 
and will understand these rules a lot more than me. But Matt, let me try and get this across to you. So this match, each team decides in advance which members will participate in the match and submits them. While each match is being played, the other wrestlers wait under the ring. Wrestler combos will be announced on the day of the event. So a six-woman tag team match will be 20 minutes, which will be wrestlers four, five, and six versus four, five, and six. There will be a tag team match, which will be 15 minutes, and that is wrestler two and three versus wrestler two and three. And then there will be a final singles match, which will be 10 minutes. So <laughs> of those 12 wrestlers, thank you, Kirsty, who has just bought me a drink, which I desperately need trying to <laughs> suss this out. Of these 12 wrestlers, Six. <laughs> I know. Incredible, as always. What a run-in. What a run-in. Papa Shango, she is not. Um, <laughs> Mr. WrestleMania 8 reference out in the middle of the Marigold Standard Experience. <laughs> Why not? Why not? So, six of those women are going to be selected to be a part of the six-woman tag match, which is a 20-minute match. Four of those wrestlers are then going to be in a tag match, and one is, and two, sorry, are going to be part of a singles match. However, we don't know what combos they are going to be. And there, you are going to have to wait under the ring until your match is ready, which means that if you are in that singles match, you have got to wait under the ring for the entirety of the six-woman tag match and the tag team match, which means that you could be under the ring for upwards of half an hour. Now, Matt, I, as speaking as someone who has never been under a wrestling ring or indeed in a wrestling ring, I can still imagine that's quite uncomfortable. Yeah, not only that, but you, you're going to be in the ring, underneath the ring. How are you going to stretch? How are you going to stay loose? Right? So you have, and we've seen people do the run-ins where you've heard they were under the ring for two and three hours, and it's just kind of a run but they're going to have upwards of a five to 20, 25 minute match. I don't need to ask me on the rules there, partner. Even though you did a great <laughs> job explaining it, I was like, holy geez, sound like a board game, you know, that uh, was created on The Simpsons. But anywho, um, so you're going to be underneath the ring for, and not only are you going to be underneath the ring trying to, you know, to stay warm, to stay loose, so you, you know, you don't get injured or pull anything because you definitely don't want that, but you're under the ring with all the stuff that goes underneath the ring. You know, you have your tables, you have your chairs, you have your medical equipment, you have the stuff that helps you, the tools that helps you, t uh, helps you take down the ring, but you're going to be underneath the ring, not by yourself, but with a whole bunch of other people as well. So, and not only that, but I've been underneath a ring, like hiding under the ring for spots. And when you get big people that are bumping or several bumps, there's a split second where you feel that ring's going to kind of like cave into you and there's nowhere else to go because you don't have anything. There's no give on the solid ground. So yeah, that's interesting. I did see that Sherry was going to be a part of this match and I saw the lineup of people, but to be honest with you, partner, because I was so busy and I didn't get a chance to take a look at the rules. I just thought those were the people that were going to be a part of this show. I was like, oh man, maybe Sherry's going to be wrestling Nakajima in a one-on-one -on -one match. I didn't know that all 84 people were going to be part of this uh, don't pass go, don't collect $200 style type match. <laughs> but I wonder who, uh, I don't think you have this answer, who who booked this match? Who put this together? Was this like 420 booking? Like, what, 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 what is this? My only thought is that Vince Russo booked it. That is the only <laughs> yeah. thing I can possibly think. <laughs> Um, right. I genuinely am expecting Hornswoggle to appear um, from under the ring or maybe the boogeyman. But yes, absolute carnage in Seedling. So uh, we will definitely be uh, be talking about that match as well because, again, fingers crossed that is going to be available on Stardom World. Again, fingers crossed, but who knows. And finally, just want to talk about a little bit of a surprise appearance in Stardom who ran in Kofu on Saturday um, in a show that's going to be video on demand, so it should be on Stardom World relatively soon. But Matt, I don't know if you realize that uh, New Japan's never open weight champion, Shingo Takagi, arrived and introduced himself to present Taro Okada. Now, I don't want to pull my fantasy booking hat on straight away, but I feel like if President Okada isn't already thinking of a Hazuki versus Shingo Takagi Ironman match for the Never Openweight Championship, I feel like now is probably the time to pack it all in, isn't it? Rob, this, um, the show has...
within mere hours that they announced it was on Stardom World. So I grabbed my iPad. I was sitting on my couch watching it. Uh, my wife came in about halfway through, and she knows a decent amount of the New Japan wrestlers, and she's a big fan of Shingo. And she's like, oh, what is Shingo doing in a Stardom ring? And I said, hun, fingers crossed. And she's like, don't say it. Don't say it. I said, this is the way to go. Stardom needs to draw tickets. They need to draw tickets. Shingo versus Suzuki. There you exactly. go. You were, that's exactly what I said. She kind of just laughed. Or you can do the Rampage Dragon versus the Gorilla. I mean, there's another Ooh. one. There's another one. We talked about how we missed on the video wall the Gorilla versus the Golden Phoenix. The Rampage Dragon versus the Gorilla. There's another match you can do. Obviously, Momo Watanabe versus Shingo is a match. There's a lot of matches, but of course, I immediately went to Shingo versus Suzuki, as you did, partner. But he got a nice little reaction. The fact that he wasn't advertised and he came out and it was a nice little surprise. And he cut a promo um, to announce, I believe, like his anniversary show, or whatever. I thought that was nice. And it's nice seeing some of these New Japan wrestlers, especially the ones that are some of the bigger stars, like a Shingo showing up at a stardom show as like a bonus treat. So it's nice to see some symmetry between the best women's wrestling company and all of wrestling and stardom and one of the best wrestling companies and all of wrestling men's wrestling companies and one new Japan, considering the fact they're both under the same umbrella. And we've seen the, uh, the stardom wrestlers wrestle on the new Japan shows a handful of times over the past few years. So it's nice to see one Shingo come out and a, cut, a nice little promo and get a nice little reaction. So I thought that was, that was cool. But yes, my friend, I know me and you, even though it's a far-fetched dream, but you know that if you uh, dream it, you can do it. We will be pulling for that Shingo versus Hazuki match somewhere down the line, maybe at that uh, historic crossover to Electric Boogaloo show. <laughs> um, uh, just quickly, sort of talking about Marigold Fields Forever, as we did earlier on the show, um, Dave Meltzer did watch the show um, and gave his ratings in the Wrestling Observer Newsletter. The, ma- the ratings are as follows. Uh, Nanai versus Yuzuki got three and a half. Uh, Mikue Ono versus Ishikawa got three and a quarter. Mariah and Shiaki got three and a quarter. The time limit draw between May Sakurai, Zayda Steele, and Myla Grace and Nagisa Nozaki got a two stars. Uh, Chika Goto and Koki Amurai um, and Misa Matsui and Natsumi Shiozuki got three. And then in your main event, that got four and a half stars as well, which seems to be Dave's uh, default Joshi fantastic match mark. Um, I, I don't have anything... Um, hugely um a huge issue to say about any of these really there's the odd one i would have given slightly more to but there's nothing that i am screaming with outrage about matt no i always say that if you want to when it comes to these big joshi main events especially stardom now all of a sudden we got marigold you just add a uh you know if it's a match that absolutely blows your your, your you know blows your mind like oh my god this is a must see absolute must see um, whatever dave gives add a half a star uh how Shuri versus Julia at Dream Queendom 2 didn't get a five-star rating. I don't know. How Mayu versus Shuri from earlier this year didn't get uh, five stars. I don't know. And how Sari versus Mayu didn't get five stars. I don't know. Considering, so, considering in fact, some of these matches that break the five-star scale rating. And I'm not saying they don't deserve it. Don't get me wrong. But I'm like, really? Like, this match that I've seen is way better than this one. But, uh, yeah, that's why I just tell people, whatever people are outraged on Meltzer. Like, do you see what Meltzer gave this match that I know that you and Rob gave five Five stars, or you and Rob gave a, you're close to a perfect rating, dude. You see what he gave it? I'm like, Meltzer's rating. You know, let him do what he wants. You know, he's the most celebrated wrestling journalist journalist ever, and there's a reason why. There's a reason why Dave does know his stuff. But I always say, if it bothers you, just add a half a star and move on with it, and go on with your lives, folks. <laughs> and that is exactly what we are going to do now, because we are going to go on and look at the two shows from Sunday, the 26th of may from shinkiba first rain the spiritual home of stardom and um, we're going to start with the afternoon show which was in front of 284 people just to give you a little indication it's the higher end of average attendance in shinkiba which is sort of anything around the 300 mark i believe it's around about a 300 seater venue i believe the record um, attendance in Shinkiba is 466 people, um, and that was indeed stardom, but they've run that venue, I believe, 
close to 200 times and very 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 rarely have they managed to get an attendance that high it tends to be around in between 285 and 325 people so anywhere in that sort of venn diagram of those two numbers is a good number so uh, i'm sure marigold will be happy with that number especially when you consider there's no julia and there's no nanai on these cards um uh, i'll just go through the results and then we'll talk about this card so we opened with a singles match koki amare defeating naya Ishikawa in nine minutes with the amethyst butterfly Myla Grace then defeated Zayda Steele in 7 minutes and 27 seconds with the fall from Grace. Um, in a three-way match, a very entertaining three-way match, I must admit, Bozilla defeated both Utami Hayashita and Victoria Yuzuki in 9 minutes and 42 seconds. Bozilla pinning Yuzuki with the Vader Bomb. In your semi-main event tag team action, Mikue Ono and Natsumi Shozuki defeated the team of Chiaki and Misa Matsui. Uh, Mikue Ono pinning Matsui with the Styles Clash, a beautiful reversal into the Styles Clash uh, in 13 minutes and 22 seconds. And then in your main event, Nagisa Nozaki and Sare defeated Mei Sakurai and Mirai in 16 minutes and 31 seconds. Sari gained the pinfall over Mei Sakurai with a diving double foot stomp in 16 minutes and 31 seconds. Um, Matt, lots and lots of good things to talk about here. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Koki Amare, who I feel Marigold are really, really, really putting their their eggs into Koki's basket um, without that sounding weird. Um, but they're clearly very, very high on her. Um, I've got a couple of points about the likes of Mirai Nutami, who uh, there was something very interesting in the world of social media where I saw people who were annoyed at the fact that we are three shows into Marigold's existence and both Mirai and Nutami are one and two with two losses. Um, which I'd like to get into in a little bit. And uh, I also want to talk about the team of Miku Aono and Natsumi Shoza uh, Shozuki because, Jesus, as a team, they are phenomenal. But, Matt, what should people be checking out from the show? What were some of your highs? What were some of your lows? What did you enjoy about this afternoon show from Shinkiba? I thought the first two matches were good. You talked about Koki Amare as somebody that they're high upon. It really seems like Na Nayao Ishikawa and Victoria Yuzuki, it seems like they're kind of just having them eat a whole bunch of L's and they're frustrated and that they're going to bring them from the bottom up. So it almost seems like they're kind of doing the same thing with both of them, but kind of in different ways. Where you see Ishikawa is just very upset. Like she's so close to getting that first win. And it's almost like she just wants to get that monkey off her back. With Victoria Yuzuki, again, she's relatively still a rookie. So she looks like she's really still going to come in her own. Where like Ishikawa, just, she's just so frustrated. And she's cutting these promos backstage. And kudos to the fine folks at Marigold that are putting these backstage promos up on social media where you can just see the passion of Ishikawa when she's making you so endearing because she's fighting so hard to get that first win. So I really, really like that even though she doesn't have any wins and she's eating L's, especially first match, uh, both these shows, she's eating L's, but they're doing something very interesting with her. So uh, it's really cool to see where they're going with that. Zeta Steele and Miley Grace, I thought they were both, that uh, that was very, very good. I like how Miley Grace is doing a top rope Fez press. So I thought that's really cool, something into her arsenal. And Zeta Steele is very enduring to the crowd. She does do a good job getting the crowd involved in her matches. And kudos to the crowd. I, I know it was the, the same venue, but all 10 of these matches that we're going to talk about, the crowd was into every single one of them. So uh, kudos to the wrestlers over at Marigold. But yeah, my man, it really seemed like this show really picked up from that three-way uh, with uh, uh, Victoria Yuzuki, Utami Hayashista, and Bozilla. I do want to throw this question out at you, buddy, and I know I think you're probably going to agree with me. Did you notice that ever since Natsupoi had the long hair back in and uh, she added yellow into her gear, that her and Yuzuki, for a split second, they looked the same? Yes, very briefly. Yes, I did realize <laughs> that. <laughs> Yuzuki came out, and I was just like, and I was like, wait a minute, is Natsupoi doing a run? And I'm like, oh, wait a minute. There's literally something. They're not the same uh, people, which I thought was pretty funny. Um, but no, really good stuff here. I liked how Utami and Yuzuki had a team up. On, I mean, it was a simple strategy. Bozilla was very dominant in that very first Marigold show. So Utami and Yuzuki, early on, they realized, like, look, if we want to win this match, 
we're going to have to take out the big badass in Bozilla. And they try and they try and they do a pretty good job. You can tell Utami's directing traffic in this match. Um, I'm guessing Utami's the one that put this match together. And then eventually as they get up a little bit on Bozilla, it is um, Bozilla comes in with like a double suplex and like a double spear. And to the point where people start chanting Bozilla's name. And to the point where uh, just Utami just gets taken out and then she hits the Vader bomb onto Yuzuki. And then cuts a promo where she drops the F-bomb, Rob. So we know that the, maybe Bozilla isn't for the kids. I'm not sure. But <laughs> she drops an F-bomb and basically tells Utami, like, hey, they were chanting my name. And uh, we mentioned before we hit the record button, not sure if that that's what was supposed to happen. But at the same time, it's very pair at Cork and Hall. 1,500 people were chanting Bozilla in a match that had Sari, Julia, and Utami in. Mm -hmm. And in this match, they were chanting for Bozilla. And Bozilla, instead of ignoring it, was like, look, Utami, they're, they're, they're chanting my name. And maybe this is a program that they're going to be working up to, you know, up until the summer. Maybe they're going to be working something with Bozilla and Utami, which I am all for. And, uh, again, they're not shying away from it. It's like clearly the crowd is behind Bozilla instead of saying, well, wait a minute, this isn't what's supposed to happen. But this is what the crowd's doing. Let's not acknowledge it. They are acknowledging it. And very much you take a look into the Japanese crowd all the way back into the 80s and 90s. Stan Hansen, Bruiser Brody, they were supposed to be the heels in a lot of these matches going up against, like, the Inokis and the Babas and whatnot. But they were just so endearing, these badass foreign heels that were just straight-up ass-kickers that they were got cheered by the crowd. And maybe that's something that we see with Bozilla. I've never seen any of her matches before Marigold. I think you're in the same boat, my friend. But she was absolutely terrific here and somebody that the crowd absolutely gets behind. And I don't think you tweak anything with her character. You just make they didn't turn Stan Hansen into hugging babies and uh slapping high fives or anything like that. He was a straight up ass kicker. I think you keep Bozilla as she is and keep her in these great matches with the Utamis, with the Marais, which we'll get into in the next match. But I thought this was a really, really good match. And this is where, again, the first two matches were pretty good. But this is where this uh, card picked up for me, my friend. A really good three-way dance with everybody looking really good. I had this one at three and three-fourth stars, my friend. Yeah, it's it's funny you should say that. I think I had it three and a half. Um, you say this is where the card picked up for you, and I'm, I'm the exact same. Um, I thought Koki and um, Ishikawa did a good job there was a couple of miscommunications there um and they were fairly fairly large miscommunications but they were able to recover quite well um Myla Grayson's Ada Steel we talked a lot about them um in the time limit draw they had at uh, Marigold Fields forever mm -hmm. and we sort of said you know it's it's a lack of chemistry um it could be a lack of timing it could be you know everything from jet lag and everything in between so I was really intrigued to see how these two in particular went in uh, in these two cards i thought there was still a lack of heat between the two of them that's not to say either wrestler is bad obviously that's that's not what i'm saying um and i thought both women had better outings on um in the evening um but as a pairing i'm i'm not i'm not massive into these two um uh, um, you know, Myla Grace's finish was interesting. Um, I quite like it. I liked her top rope Luthez press. I thought she did a great um, tornado DDT off the apron as well. Zayda Steele's character is very good. Again, I know that she's only been wrestling, I think, for a year. So there's so much room for improvement and things like that. And credit to her because I think both women, you know, they look good. They're comfortable in their characters. And I think there's just maybe a little bit of improvement to uh, to match the style. Um and I think, again, both women sort of took steps to do that um, in the evening. Um, but yeah, the three-way match, really, really good. I enjoyed the fact, like you mentioned, Matt Utami and Yuzuki made it very clear from almost the opening bell that they were both going to team up on Bozilla to try and get the victory. Didn't matter who won as long as Bozilla didn't. And actually, there was one point where... Um, Yuzuki, I think Utami had hit her with a drop kick and then uh, Yuzuki hit her with another one and then went for a pinfall. And Utami's literally pressing down on Yuzuki's back to try and give her the pinfall. So it was very much a case of, I don't care who wins, we just don't want Bozilla to win. And it was really, it's something that we were talking about before we came on air because ultimately, Bozilla could be posing Marigold a little bit of a problem here, a problem in the best possible way, because yes, she is a dominant heel. Yes, she is, you know, she's supposed to be this big foreign monster. You know, you think in the in the 
in the ilk of, you know, okay, a Stan Hansen, or, you know, if you're looking at um, stardom, an alpha female. Which is ironic when you can say that Bozella is the champion of uh, Jazzy Gabert's promotion. Um, uh, but she seems to have this inherent charisma that just appeals to an audience. You know, we talked about the reaction to Mariah at Corrigan Hall on the 20th of May. And yet, for me, Bozilla got the biggest reaction on this entire card. Everyone loved her, and she didn't do anything differently, and I think that is perfect. She doesn't need to do anything differently. She doesn't need to begin pandering to the crowd. She doesn't need to start doing babyface things. Just keep being a destroyer. And because she's got this moniker of, I believe her nickname at the moment is the biggest kaiju, so she really is playing into this monster thing. It really is getting over with the crowd. And I think the problem that start, that uh, Marigold have, sorry, is that how far do you push Bozilla? Because obviously we are going to be getting to a point where we need to begin crowning red belt champions and white belt champions, world of, uh, Marigold world champions and uh, Marigold United national champions. Do you give Bozilla one of those belts? Because ultimately, my thought with Bozilla was after Corrigan, okay, you have a go quite deep into this tournament if you are to have a tournament to crown the champion. Um, and then you have a Mirai dethrone Bozilla. Okay, be that first person to beat Bozilla. And even though I still think that's probably the way they should go, I don't think anyone who watches Marigold would hate Bozilla being that first Red Belt champion. And that's wild to say. She's massively over with the crowd. The crowd love her. She's fit in seamlessly into this role she's got as this top heel foreigner in uh, Marigold. And then if she's to have, you know, two or three title defenses at the top of the company, really, so for example, say, I don't know, Koki Amore, for example, against Bozilla. You know, Koki Amore loses but gives Bozilla a really, really, really good match. Koki Amore gets over. You could do the same with uh, Amisa Matsui, for example, or even Amei Sakurai, or a Nao Ishikawa. I'd love that. And then have someone like a Mirai eventually dethrone Bozilla as the Red Belt champion. All I'm saying is, I'm not saying that that's going to happen. I'm not even saying it's a good idea. What I am saying is, Bozilla has forcibly inserted herself at the top of Marigold, and I am all the way here for it, mate. Here's something. You made a lot of good points, brother, and it's, it's going to be interesting because sometimes you have to pivot. Sometimes you have an idea that you want to do, mm -hmm. and the crowd the crowd ultimately decides on where you want to go. And I know you can tweak a little things to kind of be like, no, 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 we're, we're going to go this way, and you, you can make it that way. But here's something you got to think about too, partner. And again, you made a lot of really good points. Is say we have a tournament final in Cork and Hall, packed 14, 1500. Your final is Utami versus Bozilla. And clearly, I think once this company was started, we were like, okay, well, eventually Julie is going to be going WWE. Your ace, whether you want to crown her on the first show or first champion, or you want to give a three, four year run, is Utami Hayashista. So say that is your main event to crown your first champion in a tournament final, Bozilla and Utami. Again, Cork and Hall, 14, 1500 people. And you have pegged for Utami to win this, win the match, to be your first champion. And the crowd is firmly behind Bozilla for this match, very much like we saw on the first Marigold show. And Utami wins, and the crowd turns on it. And they're not happy with this, that decision. Utami Ayashista has wrestled every match underneath Rossi Ogawa. You know, she debuted in stardom. Rossi's never had this problem before where she were. Obviously, they pushed Utami from day one. There's a reason why. She's fantastic. She's a wrestling prodigy. She really is. She's one of the best wrestlers in the world. This is a problem that Rossi Ogawa has never had before where they have kind of turned. And I'm not saying it's going to happen, but it's a poss It's a real possibility. It's something i got to be thinking of that it's like, ooh, they might turn against this. So is this something that maybe we change mid-match? Is this something we're just like, okay, we're just still going to go with it? But at the same time, you have your first crowning of your very first champion on this sh on a show, and Utami is your champion, and they've never booed Utami since she debuted back uh, back in 2018. Everybody's loved Utami; she's terrific. And now it's like eh, we're not booing because we don't like Utami; we're booing because the other option in this match was Bozilla. 
And that's what they, that's what we wanted. That's something that they have to think about. At the same time, is Rossi, Bozilla, Utami smart enough that um, if the current direction or the direction they want to go is the right direction and they can kind of pivot and get the crowd behind Utami? Probably. But at the same time, it's something that they have to be thinking about in the back of their heads. At the same time, Rob, it makes it for something really, really entertaining. Again, for somebody who three, four weeks ago, I've never even seen Bozilla wrestle. And she's the most over wrestler on this roster. So a really interesting thing, like you said, um, it's a problem. But at the same time, it's a good problem to have. So we'll see what will happen. But I'm all here. I'm all for it, my friend. Let's move on then to Miku Aono and Natsumi Shozuki. Um, uh, what a team. Like, even aside from the seamless reversal of uh, Matsui attempting the Hurricane Rana and being caught with the Styles Clash, I thought these four women were tremendous. We saw glimpses of what Chiaki was able to do at Marigold Fields forever, but I feel like the focus was, and, and rightly so to a certain extent, on Mirai and the reaction to her and that just disgusting Larry that she ended up finishing the match with. However, I thought here all four women were really, really good to the point where this was actually my match of the show. I enjoyed it that much. Um, and I enjoyed it as much as I did because Ayono and Shozuki were so seamless as a team, were so in control of everything as a team. And we talked, obviously, last episode that Marigold were going to be introducing uh, tag team championships, um, which are going to be the uh, Twin Star Championships, as a nod to uh, Arsian. Can you think of a reason that it shouldn't be Miku Aono and Natsumi Shozuki that win those belts? Because genuinely, you have got two extremely, extremely talented wrestlers who are able to wrestle a variety of different styles and who, to my knowledge, haven't teamed together on a regular basis but wrestled this match as though they'd been teaming together for years. Fantastic match. All four women did their absolute best in this. And when I talked about people having to step up to the plate because of notable absences, these four women were the women that I meant. Absolutely great match. Three and three quarter stars. Really, really, really solid match and solid performances from all four women. And I thought even though Matsui is your, sort of your outlier as the, uh, the flyweight of the four women, I thought she had some really, really, really good exchanges. Had a really, really good series with uh, with Miku Aono during this match. I'm going to answer your question you just asked uh, about a minute ago. Can I think of a better, or can I think of a reason why we wouldn't crown uh, Miko and uh, Shozaki as the first uh, tag team champions? I'll give you two reasons. Uh, if they bring in the Innova sisters <laughs> and or the Killer Bees, and or the Killer Bees, buddy, give me some uh, jumping Jim Bronzel. And some B. Brian Blair, let's go. Um, but no, no, I think these two, these two are absolutely fantastic together. These are the two wrestlers on the first show that I've never seen before that absolutely blew me away as far as an in-ring uh, product goes. I thought these two were, were terrific. They work the style that I like. Ano is so good with the strikes and the kicking where uh, uh, Natsumi Shozaki with the arm bar and how she gets into the arm bar and how she works it in, into the match. And the fact that, again, these two wrestlers that jumped off the page for me at that are teaming together here. I thought they worked so terrific together. And clearly, I'm like, this is the way they need to go. These two, not unless they have you know other championship aspirations for them, I think these two are a shoo-in to win the tag titles. Uh, Chiaka, I thought, was terrific. She jumped off the page for me at the Corkin show uh, because she was in the ring with Mirai, and that match before even the bell rang had really good heat, and then she took that insane lariat. But I got to say, Matsui is the one that impressed me the most in this match because Again, I only saw her just from that very first Marigold show. I thought she was good in her match, but here she was terrific. She used like that high speed style to go up against the striking and submission style of Ano and uh, Natsumi Shozaki. I thought she was terrific here. I thought they gelled everything well together. I like how Chaka came in uh, for almost like a hot tag, and then they built her up and made her look really dominant here. And they built to a really good finish. And the fact that this got 13 minutes didn't go too long. 
didn't go too short. It was probably my second favorite match of these two shows. I thought it was absolutely terrific and a great way to go into what was incredible main event. I'm with you right right there with your partner. I had this one at three and three fourth stars. This was terrific, and I would love to see uh, the, the um, uh, Marigold run this match back again because this was this was fantastic. We talk then about the main event, Nikita Nozaki and Sari versus me, Zachary and Marai. Matt, you were very, you were very full of praise, shall we say, uh, for Mace Akarai before we went on air. And when you hear those four names again, Nagisa Nozaki and Sari, uh, Mace Akarai and Marai, one of those names is not like the other in terms of wrestling style. And that is obviously Mace Akarai. Mace Akarai is a wrestler with a great gimmick. Um, but I think you would agree in, with me saying that she is perhaps a mid-carder. Um, and again, I don't mean that in a disparaging way. I just mean that when you consider that Mirai, Sari, and Nozaki could formulate a lot of your main event, I don't think May Sakurai is on that level. However, May Sakurai seemed to be on a single woman mission to prove everything I said wrong because those exchanges that she had with Sari during this, even though Sari ultimately would hand her her ass on several occasions, um, the fact that she repeatedly stood up to Sari, to Nozaki, and would not lie down, I think really, really, really endeared her to the Shinkiba crowd. Of course, Nozaki was great. Of course, Sari was great. Of course, Mirai was great. And let's not forget, Sari and Mirai is a match that we may very well be getting, and I am super excited for that. But I thought May Sakurai deserves her plaudits here because for someone who, when she debuted in stardom, I could not wait to see her off my television. And I openly admit that. When she debuted, I thought she was absolutely dreadful. There was no upside to her. She was bland, bland, bland. Um, and in fact, she debuted at roughly the same time as Wakasuki Armour. And I would have had Wakasuki Armour 55 times and twice on Sunday over May Sakurai. And I am so happy with the progress that May Sakurai has made. I'm so blown away by how she was able to step up to Sari. And yes, again, she got handed on several occasions, especially when they were having those forearm and slap exchanges. But the fact that she kept standing up, she kept standing up to one of the hardest hitters in Joshi. I was all in on this match. I thought this was absolutely fantastic and full, full credit to May Sakurai, Matt. We've talked a lot about Chuck Norris on this podcast and about how he's still able to kick more butt than an FWC versus Crazy Star title match well into his 80s. Even more shocking than that is that he looks even more jacked than ever and seems to have more energy than guys half his age. Well, it's all thanks to Morning Kick, a revolutionary new daily drink from Roundhouse Provisions that combines ultra-potent greens like spirulina and kale with probiotics, prebiotics, collagen, and even ashwagandha. Just mix with water, stir, and enjoy. Unlike other green drinks out there, this one tastes exactly like strawberry lemonade and has more five-star reviews than Dave Meltzer could ever dream of. Since I started drinking Morning Kick, I've never felt better. My digestion is smoother, my body looks leaner, I have energy all day, I just feel younger. Go to roundhouseprovisions.com forward slash stardomcast for up to 44% off your regular priced order. Plus, every purchase is backed by a 90-day money-back guarantee. So if you want to experience smoother digestion, a boost of energy that will make you feel ready to challenge for that high-speed championship, and just an overall healthier body, then go to roundhouseprovisions.com forward slash stardomcast today. And now, back to today's episode. Rob, I'm gonna in the two and a half years that we've been podcasting together, partner. I'm gonna say something very controversial, literally to the point you may edit this out and then fire me off the air. However, I think it's a statement that needs to be made. My Sakurai, we've seen all of her matches since 2021, and again, no disrespect, she is a mid carder that's got a really good gimmick and a really good hat. Rob Goodwin, this was easily, in my opinion, Sakurai's best performance, her best match I've ever seen her have. And granted, she's in the ring with three fantastic wrestlers, but she leveled up. Rob Goodwin, 
here comes the controversy. I hope you're sitting down. I hope whatever Kirsty brought you has a little bit of gin in it, because this may may rub you the wrong way. I don't know, but I I gotta make I gotta call it like I see it. Sakurai's best performance was this match. She did not have a hat. Is it the hat that's <laughs> hindering her performance? That's cool. something we have to look. And she did not attempt the elbow drop in any of these shows. So it's something we have to look at, right? We have to be professionals. What What's your opinion on that? I d- I look, I, I don't <laughs> want you to say things that you can't take back. Um, <laughs> because I... Th- I <laughs> Much as I, uh, much as I believe that May Sakurai's had a whirlwind performance here, and I thought she actually did pretty well against Myla Grace in the evening as well, um, and it was noted the fact that we had no hat, we had no cat. Do I think? <sighs> much as I don't want it to be, it is hard to, it is hard to ignore the evidence. Maybe it is the hat that was hindering, hindering May Sakurai, Matt. Maybe. We'll have to uh, just continue to uh, monitor the situation and report it back here every week on the Marigold Standard Experience, my (laughs) friend. But uh, all seriousness, yeah, you touched, but obviously we're getting Julia, as long as Julia versus Sari. We're getting that in the summer. Again, if Julia heals up according to plan, we're going to get that utami Sari match somewhere down the line. But hold your horses. Hold your horses on those two former Red Belt champions against Sari. I want this Mirai Sari match, and we're probably going to get it probably in the next handful of weeks because they were great. Nozaki was terrific as well. I thought her exchanges with Mirai were great. I liked how very much in the Cork and Hall tag match, that kind of, that really was a very low-rated match that her and May Sakurai really picked up where they left off, and she really starts abusing Sakurai to the part where Sakurai's like, nope, I don't care. I'm bringing it back, and there's a, um, a blistering set of forearms that she gave to Nozaki, and a huge running Yakuza kick that she gave to Sari that I was like, oh, she's going to pay for that. And she does. I mean, that double stomp at the end was, I think even Azu- if Azumi was there, she would have been like, damn, kid, slow down, relax, calm down. Um, but yeah, there's uh, Sakurai. She brings it here. She does. I mean, and not only that, but she does a lot of like Julia style grappling where she goes for one thing and then misdirects for another to get a knee bar, to get into an arm bar, which I thought was great. I think her new gear looks great. She's always been in great shape, but she's really, really, uh, um, she's really, really, you can just see the muscles like in her forearms, uh, in her triceps and in her core. You can tell that she's taking this new fresh coat of paint that she has really, really seriously. Again, she was terrific here. Everybody was great, but Sakurai really jumped off the page here. Uh, Mirai versus Nozaki, I thought was great. Again, Nozaki gets the advantage on uh, Sakurai. Mirai comes in just absolutely cleans house. Mirai and Sari. When I when this match comes down to its core, it's all about Mirai versus Sari and kind of the mini exchanges that, that they had. They built up to a match that I know we want to see. Ultimately, though, Sari hitting that insane double stomp at the end. Easily my favorite match of these two shows. Four and a quarter stars for me. And it's nice to see Mei Sakurai. Again, somebody who was in the middle of the card at stardom being put in a main event position here and absolutely hit it out of the park. I'm so happy for her. Yeah, and I think it's it is important that we mention again who else was in this match. Like she was in there with huge names in Marigold. You know, Mirai, who we pegged as a future Red Belt champion. Sari, who has been, you know, rightly touted as one of the workers of the year. Um, and Nagisa Nozaki, who I'm a huge, huge fan of. And yet May Sakurai, who, you know, whether by lack of hat or lack of cat, um, has been standing up and doing a fantastic job. I think it's I think it's unlikely that she'd have been in this spot was Ju- were Julia fit, but the fact that she was put into this position and she stood up and was counted was was tremendous. I gave this four stars, um, and I think that sort of carry on of May Sakurai and Nozaki and Julia and Sari, that sort of um sort of triangle that we're going through, I think was uh, was really, really good. And then we set stuff up as well for the grand opening show in Corrigan Hall, um, which will be on the eleventh of June. That will be streaming live on Wrestle Universe. Um Sari was uh, stepped up to by Victoria Yuzuki, who basically said, I want you at Corican. Sorry, laughed and was more than happy to uh, to acquiesce to Yuzuki's request, which means that we are probably going to see a live murder. Um, and we also had Nozaki 
um, challenging, well, no, we had Ishikawa challenge Nozaki and Nozaki accept, and that is going to be a singles match as well. Both those matches have been made official for the Corican Hall show, as well as another match that we are going to be talking about very, very shortly. But those two matches, Matt Sari and Victoria Yuzuki and uh, Nagisa Nozaki versus um, now Ishikawa, how are we feeling about those? Yeah, I'm all for it. Again, we're getting fresh matchups right off the start. We're going to be able to see what these wrestlers can do. Again, Cork and Hall is, uh, you know, hollow grounds for any wrestling company. It really seems the Joshi scene is Cork and Hall is, or is a building, a venue that Cork and Hall really leans on to set something up. So you have two big matches there, and then we're going to see, you know, what else we're going to is going to be on task. I think we know who's going to win those matches. But regardless, there are two matches that are going to be really, really good. And again, Victoria Yuzuki getting a big one-on-one -on -one match against a wrestler that a lot of us have as not only female wrestler of the year, but wrestler of the year with Sari. You know that match is going to go, you know, well over 10 minutes. So you're going to see Yuzuki really be put to the test here. It's going to be your biggest test yet. Again, considering the fact that we know she's a super rookie, but she's still a rookie and she's wrestling somebody like Sari. So yeah, really looking forward to both those matches. And then obviously it's going to be interesting to see what the rest of the card is going to look like. Yeah, agreed, agreed. Let's move on to the evening show then. Obviously, this also emanated from Shinkiba First Ring. The attendance hasn't actually been announced as of yet, um, so we'll get that to you as soon as it has been. We'll go through the results, though. Um, uh, singles match opened proceedings with Misa Matsui defeating Nao Ishikawa in 8 minutes and 53 seconds with the European Clutch. Great opening contest we'll talk about that in a moment singles match followed that may sakurai defeated myla grace in seven minutes and 38 seconds may get in the win with the shining buster um miko Aono defeated zeta steel in eight minutes with the styles clash tag team action a real another really 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 good tag team semi-main bozilla and nikisa nozaki defeated the team of chiaki and mirai in 15 minutes and 39 seconds bozilla getting the pinfall over Chiaki with a powerbomb. And then in your main event, Koki Amare and Utami Hayashishita defeated the team of Natsumi Shozuki and Victoria Yuzuki in 15 minutes and 46 seconds with the German suplex. Um, Matt, what would you like to talk about in terms of the second show from Shinkiba? Um, match one and two again. They were they were good. They were you know they, it didn't go over time. It was something that uh, it was a good job to warm up the crowd. Again, I mentioned how uh, Ishikawa was eating losses in these opening matches, and they're building towards her character. And again, my Sakurai looked really good in her match with uh, Mila Grace, and nice to see her getting her win. But I thought Zeta Steel looked fantastic here. Again, me and you have been both uh, since we started with this uh, the starting cast gold experience standard. Um, or not starting cast, excuse me, the Marigold. The Marigold. Uh, wow. I, I, ma I mailed it everything together. Look at that. That's our next bumper sticker. Um, ever since we st we uh, started this uh, venture on uh, covering Marigold, me and you were very big on Miko Ano. Zeta still, I thought her, she was terrific here. The way that she're, she's able to, again, very endearing towards the crowd, was able to know when to pop the crowd in this match. You know, she does work a very cocky heel style and Ano would just like take her to task. But there's one spot, one spot where she, uh, she hits a code breaker while they're fighting on the apron and then does a dive that really got the crowd involved. I thought that was really good. And then the match really just picks up from there and it peaks at the right point with eventually, uh, Miku Ano hitting the, uh, the styles clash. I thought this was really good. Zeta Steel is somebody that is catching my attention and is doing does a great job working her gimmick. Like she understands what she needs to do and when to do it. She doesn't go too fast. She knows when to pause. She has really good crowd psychology. And when you're wrestling somebody as good as Mika Ano, I think that you're going to just have a mix of just really, really good uh, chemistry and good mat and really good stuff. This was my favorite match of the show. I actually had it at three and three four stars. I really enjoyed this one. Wow, that's that's really quite big praise. Um, and this was something I was very interested in because we'd only seen Zayda Steel and Myla Great against each other. And I wasn't enamored with the chemistry that they had. So I was intrigued to see how both these women wrestled someone different. And I was actually, similar to you, quite impressed with the way that Zayda Steel 
wrestled Miku Aono. I feel like she is very in touch with her cocky, arrogant, bratish character. Um, but there was something that didn't quite translate. I know that she's got the talent. And again, she's been wrestling for, I believe, only a year. Um, yeah, she's been wrestling since the 7th of August, 2022. So just over a year. Um, which, you know, is incredible. She's 20 years old. She's got nothing but upside, but wasn't quite putting things together. This was the first real flash. And again, we're only three matches into uh, into a Marigold career, but this was the first real flash that I saw. Yes, I saw her get it now. And again, she's in ring with Miku Aono, who me and you are huge on from the early days of Marigold. But yeah, completely agree. I think Zeta Steel did a very, very, very good job here. Didn't like it quite as much as you, um, but certainly Zeta Steele's best outing in Marigold. Something I was interested in, though, Matt, was your opinion on Miss Sakurai and Myla Grace. Um, this was another match where I thought there was some really good bits, but there was some quite obvious miscommunications. And I was wondering if you thought the same. Yeah, the same. It really seemed like it started out really good. Again, when you have somebody that speaks Japanese and somebody that speaks English, sometimes you'll have that language barrier. And it seemed like they, whatever issues, if they were going to have any issues, it seemed like they were on the same page. And then it it really seemed like the middle of the match, they got a little bit lost, but they were able to quickly turn it around. Yeah, but yeah, there's a little bit of miscommunications, maybe some mistiming, maybe some uh, ring positioning spots that really were maybe a half a step up, uh, uh, excuse me, half a step off, which will happen from time to time. But at the same time, if you're off on something just a little, it can be noticeable. Eventually, as they get to the end, they were able to put the pieces back together, and Sakurai does get the win with the Shining Buster. But it's all stuff that is going to be worked out in training. We've seen these girls are in training quite a bit almost every day, and with Zeta Steele and Miley Grace over here for, we don't know how long they're going to be over here for. They were announced as of the official roster. So maybe they're going to be over here six months, eight months, a year. I don't know. I think this is something that the longer that they stay in Japan, and they'll be able to break down the language barriers a little bit. They're going to be in the ring training, again, with the Sakurais, with the Marais, with the Atamis, the Julias, the Nice, so on and so forth. And it's all little things that they're going to pick up, and they're only going to get better. So I'm really excited in five, six months from now when we're talking about Miley Grace and Zeta Steel, how much better they're going to get, because there's going to be little things like this that they kind of miss and didn't string together, and by no means did it ruin the match. But at the same time, it could have made the match flow a little bit better. So, uh, yeah, I see your point there. It wasn't anything horrendous, but I think it's something that's going to be an easy fix, you know, as long as they put the work in, which I know they're going to, and it's something they're only going to get better at. Yeah, and this isn't me saying, oh, they're both terrible wrestlers and should never step foot inside a ring again. That's not the case at all. It's just a case of there's something that isn't quite clicking. Um, and again, I'm sure it will come with practice. I know that Bozilla is certainly on a longer run. I'm sure, and I cannot think for the life of me where I've read this, but I'm sure I've read that she's down for nine months um, on this tour. So whether that's the case, obviously we saw uh, Mariah May do something similar for Stardom when she was in Stardom for nine months. Um, I don't know if that's the case, um, but if Myla Grace and Zayda Steele are doing something similar, then I am... Very excited to see where their progress um, takes us. I mean, speaking of Mariah May, like we saw her debut in Stardom in January of 2023, and she will admit and has admitted on several occasions that she was greener than grass when she first debuted. And then you look at you know her progress through the five star heading into September, and it was like watching a completely different wrestler. So I'm sure that we'll see huge amounts of progress from Myla and Zayda, especially when, you know, you're stepping into a ring with uh, your likes of Miku Aono, Utami Hayashista, Mirai, um, and Julia when she's fit again, Nanai Takahashi. Obviously, we're seeing Nanai Takahashi um, undertaking her passion injection matches again, which I personally think both Myla Grace and Zayda Steele will benefit hugely from. We saw in stardom when Nanai did it for people like Miyu Amasaki, for Lady C, for, you know, the wonder she worked with Wakasugiyama. So working with Nanai, I think, would be really, really good, not just because of the exposure it would give them on a car, but also because Nanai is so experienced 
Like, you're not going to find many people in Joshi as experienced and as knowledgeable as Nanai. And if they're, you know, if they're going to learn from her, then I think we're going to see plenty of things there. Because both women, there are things there that you look at and go, yeah, this is going to be really, really good. And I think it's just a case of maybe putting all of those blocks together. I think we saw the first flashes of it with Zayda Steele. I can't wait to see it with Myla Grace because, again, she's got some really, really, really good upside. We just need it to come together. Um, uh, what did you think about the opener, though? I know we talked about, we've sort of skipped about here, talked about Myla Grace and Zayda Steele, but Misa Matsui and now Ishikawa, I absolutely love this match. And I said at the start during the news segment when we were talking about Ishikawa's injury, I cannot believe how invested I am in Ishikawa. And even after the match, that promo that she cuts, which is just lay, like layered dripping almost with passion about how she keeps being defeated by the actress girls and she's going to go on this tear as an actress killer just really really passionate and it just makes you root for her even more and it there's so few wrestlers that really make you root for them and i feel like ishikawa in the fledgling weeks of marigold's run has really, really taken that bull by the horns and has really made herself almost the underdog of Marigold. We all thought it was going to be Victoria Yuzuki and Yuzuki has knocked it out of the park every time she's gone in the ring, which we knew she would do. But in terms of an underdog, I think Ishikawa is more of an underdog maybe than Yuzuki, Matt, which is, uh, which is not something I thought I'd say. Yeah, and obviously, again, with us watching Start, and we've seen way more Yuzuki matches going to this than we did Ishikawa. But this was a good one. Again, Matsui, who was great on the, uh, the 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 day show, was really good here in a singles match. And I liked how we're getting towards the end of this match, and Ishikawa is really like almost dominating uh, Matsui. She hits this like stalling angels wings, which I thought was really cool. Like how she's able to just kind of uh, almost like a J driller, like basically double underhook pick her up and just hold her there and dropped her face first, which I thought was really cool. Ultimately, she gets caught in the European clutch. So again, it's something you could say where it's like, I was winning the match. I was getting close to getting my first victory. And I just, I, I just lost it for the last, you know, it takes three seconds. I got caught in something and it only takes three seconds to, uh, to get a win or a loss. So again, she's getting so close to getting these first wins. We're building it up, but yeah, she's so passionate in these losses. And the fact that we have a design storyline for her, only three shows in really shows that they are investing a lot in her, which I really, really like. And she's an absolutely fantastic wrestler. But yeah, I had that at three and a half stars. I thought it was a really solid opener. And uh, I thought both wrestlers really delivered on the uh, that very, very first match for the night show. Yeah, agreed, agreed. Um, again, Matsui is someone who I knew absolutely nothing about going into Marigold, which, you know, you could copy and paste any of the actress girls' names into that. But I think she's another one who's really, really, really sort of taken this um, this opportunity with both hands um, and clearly has a whole host of upside. She's clearly primed, ready for that uh, that flyweight division. And I think she should be the centerpiece of it because she's so good. She's so quick. She's so crisp. Um, I cannot wait to see her in uh, more high-stakes singles matches because genuinely she's, uh, she's very, very, very exciting to watch. Bozilla and Nagisa Nozaki versus Chiaki and Mirai. I want to see Mirai against Nozaki in a singles match, against Sari in a singles match, and against Bozilla in a singles match. But again, I thought Chiaki did a really, really, really good job here. And I thought actually it was right to put more of the focus on her. Um, and I think overall, again, this was a really, really, really good, hard-hitting semi-main event match. The exchanges between Bozilla and Mirai reminded me a lot of Vader and Anoki in New Japan, where it's like you have this dominant foreign heel that's just running through everybody that's a sight to be seen. And Mirai is somebody that everybody loves. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not comparing Anoki to Mirai as far as that popularity, because Anoki is probably one of, if not the most popular wrestlers in the history of uh, Japanese wrestling. But they worked like that similar striking style where Mariah's like chopping and layering and throwing everything she can to try to, try to chop down the tree that is Bozilla. And Bozilla's just moving forward. And every time 
Mariah hits a combination of strikes. It kind of stuns Bozilla just a little bit. And you think she's going to start her comeback. But eventually, like, Bozilla, like, weathers the storm and uses her strength and size to her advantage to beat up uh, Mariah here, which I thought was really good. Yeah, there's really good exchanges with uh, Mariah Nozaki. Chiaki was great here, but ultimately it was just kind of build Chiaki up just a little bit where she does. She actually, you know, I just made, I didn't even realize I did this. I made mentions to Bozilla working almost like a Vader style when the finish of the match was the Vader bomb and almost a Vader style power bomb for the finish which I thought was really good. Uh, I thought the match was good. I thought at 15 minutes, went maybe a little bit too long. I thought that was the same thing with the main event. I thought it kind of maybe lagged just a little. But don't get me wrong, all four of these wrestlers worked really well. Nozaki versus Mirai is a match I want to see. And obviously, I think they might be building towards a Mirai Bozilla match somewhere, maybe in the tournaments or for a red belt or white belt. I think that has a lot of money uh, there with, again, with Mirai just throwing these huge layers to try to, you know, weather the storm that is Bozilla. That's an easy but yet an impactful story they can tell. Ultimately, it was a good match, three and a half stars, but I thought uh, it being 15 minutes, I thought maybe went on just a little bit too long. Sort of going into um, what you've just said, um, or sort of about the people that we're talking about, um, in terms of Mirai and Utami, the thing that I've seen a couple of people say is that we are three matches into Stardom's run. We're three shows into Marigold's run, should I say. And Utami has one win, two losses. Mirai has one win, two losses. And these are the people that you should be building the company around. Surely they should be up there as people who are, you know, unbeaten. At the moment, we have Koki Amare, who's unbeaten. We are... Um, who's three from three. We've got Bozilla, who's three from three. Miku Aono, who's three from three. Um, however, my argument in seeing what Rossi's doing is people know Utami. People know Mirai. Um, and whilst there's not titles involved, whilst there's not, you know, the highest of high stakes involved, use these shows to build up the people that we don't know. You know, assume that people watching Marigold, if you are to assume they are solely stardom fans, and I'm not saying that they are, but if you are to assume they are solely stardom fans, people are going to have no idea who Miku Aono is. People are going to have no idea who Koki Amare is, who Natsumi Shozuki is, um, who... Um, who's the other one I was going to talk about, Misu Matsui, is we don't know who these people are. Use these shows to build them up. Yes, we know that Mirai is going to be a champion. We know Itami is going to be a champion. We know that these are going to be the centerpieces of this brand new company. But unless you build up other members of the roster, they are going to be in a bubble. We've already talked about the fact that Julia is not going to be there forever. She is WWE bound to the point where we know that her boyfriend and her mother are moving to America full-time with her. So it's not a case of if she goes, it's when she goes. We know that Bozilla is only on a tour with um, with Marigold. We know the same is true for Zeta Steel. We know the same is true for Myla Grace. So you are going to have to start to build up the remainder of your roster. So why not do it now? Yes, it doesn't look great that Mariah has lost two matches. But ultimately, their tag match is why she hasn't taken the pin. Same for Utami. Ultimately, for me, I think they're going the exact right way about it. Now, we know that Utami is going to be challenging Nanai Takahashi at Gorakan Hall um, in a singles match. A match, by the way, that we've never seen, and I didn't realize I wanted to see until it was announced. If Utami was to lose that, then potentially I will have more to say. However, if Utami wins that, it's a match with stakes in it as long as utami wins those matches i don't mind if you're going to give her a tag loss against a miku Aono or against an atsumi shozuki then i don't care that's fine because you are building the rest of the roster ultimately you can't only have two people over you need to have the rest of the people on the roster at a certain level as well and i think marigold for the three shows, and that's another thing. We've had three shows. Like, I'm not being funny, but we need to give this company more time 
Um, but ultimately, I, I don't have an issue with him. I don't know if I'm sort of speaking out of my arse, which is quite possible. I am British. We spend a lot of our time doing that. But do you feel something similar? You, uh, you a lot to unpack it, my friend. You said you're not being funny. You're funny all the time, brother. Give I'll yourself a little bit, a little bit you. credit there. You're always you crack me up all the time. Well, we did see uh, Nanai versus Utami once, and it was in the first round of the 2022 uh, Cinderella tournament. We did, which, yes, not, of yes, and it went to the old TLD, which about every match in that first round did. Oh God, it, it was, did, didn't it? It was the it was yeah. the most impossible to predict tournament ever. Yeah, it was, but at least that one, a lot of, if you remember, it was a lot of double eliminations. That one actually went to the 10 minute time limit draw, and it was really, really good. And I'm assuming that that match in Cork and Hall is probably going to go to the TLD. Another story, see your point where you're saying majority of the Mary Gold uh, spectators are stardom watchers, which obviously mean you are, and a lot of people that we talk to about this company our stardom watchers and they we know the marais we know the julias we know the utamis so i see your point where this like well they're eating l's but eating l's in tag matches to get the other talent over i see your point but i disagree they're clearly bearing utami and marai <laughs> rossi wants nothing to do with them no brother you are exactly right i'm totally on board with you that's just like again you know, rossi's just like hey that Thanks for jumping the ship, former winners of the Cinderella <laughs> tournament and all these. You could have stayed over and started and made a ton of money. Then, you know, you could have been fine over there. No problem. But you jumped over the ship. So my reward to you is I'm going to bury you because I don't like you, Mariah. And I don't like you. Ut- no, clearly I'm on board with you. But I'm being funny because I know you're funny as well. See, I'm trying to lay my I'm trying to level up my funny game to yours. Thank you. No, they you, it. yeah, they're they're clearly in these spotlight matches, and they're getting other talent over. Which again, more than half this roster partner mean you've never seen until that first show at Cork and Hall, and we're being blown away by a lot of really good talent that are in matches with Mariah, that are in matches with Utami and Julia. So it's really smart and easy booking, folks. It really is. Yeah, eventually Mariah Utami. You're going to be seeing them wearing championship gold. They may be the first red belt champions, white belt champions, tag champions, what have you. So they're going about this in an easy way. And again, it's not the fact, it's not that Utami's eating L's here or Mariah's eating L's left and right. They're eating L's in tag matches that the other person in the matches that are getting pinned. And you hit it. Yeah, there were three shows in. Like, it's just like, you know, they're very, let's, let's pack it up, call it a day, send them off to WWE. It's not what's happening here, folks. Relax. But uh, yeah, and it's smart booking. You're getting other talent over here. So I think the booking makes sense. And I really, uh, again, I'm really ecstatic for all these different wrestlers that we're seeing mix it up again with the top talent that was in Stardom, my friend. Now, of course, next week when Utami's lost in five minutes to Zayda Steele in the opener, like we, we're obviously going to have different conversation. But no, I again, I, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't worry too much. And again, Victoria Yuzuki is zero and three. Um, she's lost all three matches. However, she was in the main event of the evening show. She was in um, a high-profile match, again, with Bozilla and Utami in the middle of the card on the afternoon show. So even though she's picked up three losses, she's actually been in three relatively high-profile matches. She was in a match with Nanai Dagahashi that opened Marigold Fields Forever. She was in these two matches that we've talked about here, and she's given a fantastic account of herself. Doesn't feel like a rookie at all and actually feels very at home in that main event scene so she's another one that you could argue well she's lost three out of three but actually i feel like the losses have done her a whole world of good and in the meantime we have got koki amare who is being highlighted um which i think is really important you've got miku Ono who is being highlighted on these shows as well and again natsumi shozuki is another person who looks to be a really solid hand in that upper mid card do i think she'll be a future red belt champion i mean i hope so i don't think she will but i you know again we're talking from three shows however she's proved again and again and again that she is such a vital linchpin in some of these tag matches um and i thought her and victoria yuzuki actually we're a really, really good team. But again, Koki Amore, who is very, very young into her career, who Marigold are very clearly high on, again, has been given this platform. And I think that's what's important here. 
you know, we know what Utami can do. We know what Marai can do. However, you know, Koki Amare or, um, again, I keep coming back to Miku Aono, people might not know about. And that's really, really, really important. It's like now Ishikawa. Now Ishikawa, who a few more people were aware of. Um, I mean, we, we've spoken about the fact that we only knew her as not Tam Nakano. Um, but, you know, she's she's lost three out of three. Yet, in my eyes, she's one of the most spotlighted wrestlers on the on the entire roster. And I'm actually gutted that she's not going to be on the show in Osaka and the show in Hamamatsu. So, again, we it's that, that old adage that we've got on this podcast. It's not if you lose, it's how you lose. And I think that's really, really, really important. Yes, Mirai lost in the tag match with Chiaki against Bozilla and Nagisa Nozaki. However, they also set up a singles program potentially between Mirai and Bozilla. Now, if Bozilla is to go on an absolute tear and then Mirai is the one to beat her finally, then this all goes away. Like this all suddenly becomes a master plan from Rossi. So give it time. I believe it's Chris Jericho that says people want everything right now. Give it time to play out. Let people tell their stories. Let people grow. Let people do what they need to do. Um, uh, that main event, Matt, I know that you said it went a little bit too long. Um, I thought Koki Amare looked a lot better here than she did um, in the singles match on the afternoon show. Again, that wasn't a bad match, but I thought she worked really, really well in a tag team environment. So I know that the the large proportion of her experience has been in tag team action with um, Chika Goto as the Twin Towers um, but I thought she worked really really well with Utami here to the point where Utami wants to tag with her um, uh, more and more yeah this was again it was good I had a three and three four stars I really enjoyed it I just thought there were some points in the match where I thought it, it may have got a little bit a little bit too long but I'm, maybe I'm just being nitpicky here Koki Amore is again one that uh, was really impressing me Obviously, we know what Yuzuki can do. We know what Utami can do. One of the best wrestlers in the world. I really enjoyed the uh, interactions. And maybe maybe if it was more of these interactions, I wouldn't have felt that way, that the match was too long. But if we had more of uh, Natsumi Shozaki and Utami in the match, might have bumped it up to the four-star mark. Again, regardless, again, three, three, three and three-four stars. I thought it was a good match, a really good way to end uh, these two shows especially with Utami getting a win with the deadlift German suplex, which always impresses me in the way that she's able to uh, just snap back her opponent into the German suplex. Uh, again, a, a good match. Uh, not as good as the tag match from earlier on the day from that main event. Um, again, all four of these wrestlers are really, really good. I just want it maybe, maybe I'm being a little bit selfish. Maybe I'm being a little bit greedy um, that I want more of Utami versus uh, Natsumi here, because their interactions were really, really good. And hopefully somewhere down the line, we get a long singles match between the two. And that brings to an end the shows that we had. However, Marigold did announce the cards for June 1st in uh, the 176 box Osaka. Um, that's going to be video on demand. It's not going to be live streamed on Wrestle Universe. It will drop a few days later. The same is the case for June the 2nd in Act City Hamamatsu. So those will not be live streamed. However, they have announced the cards with the return of Nanai Takahashi. As I've already announced, Koki Amare will not be on these cards um, due to a prior commitment. Julia obviously will not be because of injury, as will now Ishikawa. However, um, Chika Goto will um, will be back on these cards. So the June first show from Osaka is as follows: singles action, Zayda Steel versus Nagisa Nozaki, um, uh, Chika Goto versus Victoria Yuzuki, a passion injection match, Nanai Takahashi versus Chiaki. That could be really really good. Um, Natsumi Shozuki and Misa Matsui versus Bozilla and Myla Grace. And then in your main event, Utami Hayashishita and Mirai versus Miko Aono and Mei Sakurai. Um, it's good to see Miko Aono in the main event where she absolutely belongs. But that team of Utami Hayashishita and Mirai Ma is a dangerous team. I am very excited by the promise of that team. Yeah, you got Miko Aono. Um, her gonna, she's going to mix it up with Mirai and Utami Hayashishita. That's going to be really good. And again, Sakurai I, in a main event. 
this very well could have been the Julia spot that they're just going to insert one fellow DDM member out for the other. I get that. And again, you're not going to fill Julia's shoes, but Sakurai is doing a great job. She did a great job in these two shows we just uh, we just reviewed. And the fact that she's going to be in the ring with two wrestlers that she's been wrestling uh, quite a bit over the last two years over in stardom. And it's a different my Sakurai. She's, she just seems like she's on a different level than she was the last two years over at stardom. But the, yeah, the... Uh, I'm really excited for the kick form clothesline exchanges with Mariah and Ano, uh, Mickey Ono. I think that that's gonna be really good. And as far as the undercard goes, the match I'm looking for the most on the undercard is uh, Yuzuki versus uh, Chika Goto. Mm-hmm. She obviously she was mi- she was missed to me on these shows we just reviewed. I really like her. I really like her gimmick. The fact that she already has that chant where it's go go Chika. Uh, so I really look at the, the, these shows look solid. Again, five matches. Both these cards were like an hour and a half. I'm guessing an hour and a half, hour and 40 minutes. Easy to take in as we're starting to build up this roster and build up this promotion. But obviously, the main event is the one I'm looking forward to. But as far as the undercard goes, that's definitely Goto versus Yuzuki for me, my friend. Talking about Yuzuki, she found herself in the main event of the June 2nd show in Hamamatsu with uh, a bit of a blockbuster main event, if I do say so myself. We open with singles match, Chika Goto versus Myla Grace. Uh, Chiaki will be facing Nagisa Nozaki. Another passion injection match, Nanai Takahashi versus Misa Matsui. Bookmark that match, that is going to be very good. Uh, Mirai and Mei Sakurai will be taking on Bozilla and Zeta Steel. And then in your main Main event. This could be the sh- the match of the two shows: Utami Hayashishi and Victoria Yuzuki versus Miku Aono and Natsumi Shozuki. Matt, that is going to be very very tasty. But I'm also very excited for this passion injection match: Nanai Takahashi versus Mitsu Matsui. I think that could be really really good. Yeah, we've seen Nanai with these, you know, the faster style wrestlers when she was doing the passion injection matches, really getting a lot out of them. Considering the fact that she Nanai works a completely different style than the high speed wrestlers, but they seem to be able to gel well together, which just goes to show you what a great and smart talent that Nanai, uh, Nanai Takahashi is. Again, if you revert back to our interview we did with one uh, awesome Kong, and if you're newer to the podcast, go in the archives, it's there, it's free. She made mention how Nanai is able to break down matches in certain ways to get the most out of her opponents and herself in the match. So again, the high-speed matches she had are against the, against the high-speed style wrestlers like Starlight Kid, like a Miyu Amasaki, really benefited especially Miyu Amasaki, which I think we're going to see this uh, against uh, against Misa Matsuri. I think that's going to be really good. Uh, Chika Goto versus Miley Grace is one that I think it's uh, I think it's going to be one that we're going to be talking about on the undercard as a match that really over... Um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? That was uh, over-delivered. Uh, over-delivered is, the, is the, the words I'm looking for. I think that's going to be really good. But yeah, that main event with Utami and Yuzuki. The uh, the, the team that should have been Queen's Quest, my friend, uh, mm-hmm. against the against our, our I guess our new our I guess our against our favorite tag team I guess in Marigold against Miko Ano and Matsumi Shozaki. That's going to be absolutely fantastic. And the co-main event, which I'm willing to put a decent amount of money on, is going to not only be good, but is going to see Bozilla beat up poor my Sakurai with or without the hat. But regardless. Both these shows look really good, but I'm really looking forward to the main event on this second show, my friend. Yes, I'm very, very excited by that. We also have matches announced for that grand opening wars show in Corican Hall. Uh, we already announced Yuzuki and Sari. Um, we also said that Nao Ishikawa is going to be taking on Nagisa Nozaki, but also Utami Aishista versus Nanai Takashi. Utami having called out Nanai at the end of the main event of the Shinkiba evening show. Um, there's some really, really tasty things there, which I'm very, very excited about. I think it's a huge thing that Marigold are able to have Sadi in some of these matches in the absence of Julia. And the fact that Julia is turning up on the Shinkiba shows and things like that, just to keep everyone remembering that she is in this feud with Sari, I think is really, really good. Something that I didn't mention, man, something I wanted to uh, ask your opinion on. I know Sari did an interview with Tokyo Sports where she basically said that she was going to step up in Julia's absence, and it got a whole host of negative reaction from the rest of the Marigold roster. Um, and Sari was absolutely loving it. It's great work from sorry have you seen this and like mariah came out and was like um excuse me 
I'm Mariah, what are you doing? What are you talking about? And um, Chica Goto, I think, came out and said something. Um, there was another member of the roster, I can't remember who it was. But it's brilliant just building this heat behind Sari. I think it's really, really good. Yeah, I think Utami said something like, hey, you failed over in WWE. Like, was it taking a jab at her? I'm like, you're not for... I see what wow. Utami's trying to do. Yeah, I, I see what Utami's trying to do. And partner, you know me. I'm the biggest... I'm a huge Utami. It's just the fan Queen's Quest, the Red Belt Run, the whole nine. But it's like, it wasn't like Sari was like, I got this idea that I'm going to do it NXT. Clearly, that was a gimmick they, they gave her, and it was doomed to fail from spot one. But Utami took a little jab at it. And if you think about it from a business aspect, it's smart business for these wrestlers to like, sorry, this is what Sari said. And all these wrestlers like, I'm going to take a jab because I want to get a match with Sari because she's kind of the golden freelance goose mm -hmm. where it's like, you know, she's going to have a good match. You know, it's a lot of people are going to see it and you know, you're going to get a little, a uh, little extra cheese in your Whopper when uh, Mr. Ogawa gives you that envelope at the end of, at the end of the night, because it's a match that's going to draw a lot of attention. So I think it was very smart for every wrestler that was saying, wait a minute, well, wait a minute, because you're, it's a possibility. Now you're building anticipation and you're building intrigue for a possible matchup against Sari. Again, a lot of people have her pegged as one of, if not wrestlers of the year in these first five months we're having here in 2024. So I thought it was very smart for everybody to kind of jump on that train. But I think it's also very smart for Marigold because we're clearly going towards a Sari versus Julia match. Oh, it, it's already booked um, at the uh, Summer Destiny show. If you remember when Stardom first got their hands on Sari back at the beginning part of this year, they had her in that tag match with the Chihiro Hashimoto versus Sayori Poi. And then at the end of the show, we were booked for All-Star Grand Queendom, that dream match, Mayu versus Sari. And we said on the Stardom cast, well, it's going to be easy booking to put Sari in one, two, three matches in Stardom to build towards that match with Mayu. And we never got it. We never, they didn't do anything other than the fact that it's a dream match. It's for the IWGP Women's Championship. Here it is. And don't, and it was great. It was a lot of people's match of the year, five stars from just about everybody. But you didn't. You could have built a little bit more on that because they didn't book Sari in any matches in between the uh, opening night of the Cinderella tournament and uh, All Star Grand Queen. And we're here. We're seeing Sari pretty much on every show, and you're building towards that Julia match. And again, credit to Julia, even though she can't wrestle because she's not cleared because of her injury, they're building the matchup because she's making the town. She's going to the shows, and they're cutting promos, and you could do backstage stuff. So smart on Mary Gold to kind of lock Sari down for a handful of shows, ultimately to get to a, another dream match that we want going up coming up here uh in july at the uh rio goku kukakangigan as one mayu Itani <laughs> would say in sumo hall i nailed that mayu style you say it so well my man and it makes everybody sound you do it so well because you're the professional uh, uh, of the two of us here but uh i gotta keep it gotta keep the mayu love going but yeah i mean it's really and who knows sorry is somebody that can write her own ticket if she wants to stay freelance again very much like sorry anu did for the last two years very much like suzu suzuki did for the last year year and a half and then once the money train comes in does she go to marigold does she go to stardom or the fact that uh, we're getting better stuff going on over here in wwe and i think that uh one triple h and one Shawn michaels know that they uh they really really missed the boat with sorry do they uh you know add a few extra zeros on the check to get sorry back over to the wwe and get her pro proper run and how would sorry would be booked properly in wwe just have her do what she's doing now <laughs> like you know you're not white if it's not broke don't fix it so i think it's really kudos to marigold that the fact that we have sorry locked down for a whole bunch of shows and we're seeing her in the ring with the utamis with the marais with matches that we are going to eventually be getting somewhere down the road and eventually all roads lead to again another dream match with her and julia so it's gonna be interesting to see how sorry is booked between now and summer destiny and to see what Sari wants to do between Summer Destiny and the rest of the year. So, uh, yeah, kudos to her and very smart on uh, all the starting wrestlers jumping on Sari saying, wait a minute, no, 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 because you're building up intrigue. We're going to get a match against somebody that is one of, if not the best wrestlers in all of wrestling. Completely agree, my friend. Completely agree. Ladies and gentlemen, that just about brings us to the end of this episode of the Marigold Standard. We hope you enjoyed it. Just a little bit of a programming note. As I mentioned before, the shows from Osaka and from Hamamatsu are going to be video on demand. There's a chance that they will not be up 
in time for us to watch them um, by the 3rd of June. So what we will do is instead on the 3rd of June, we will drop our interview with Sonny Gutierrez. So you will still have an episode of the Marigold Standard. And then the week after, um, we will talk about our, we will talk, we will do that episode um, with those two shows and hopefully the uh, the Corican show as well. We'll sort of look at how we're going to do that because I think the Corican show is the Tuesday. We'll keep an eye on the Marigold podcast on Twitter um, for any updates regarding that. But in the meantime, thank you so much for listening. We hope you enjoyed it. We hope you're enjoying the Marigold standard as much as we are doing it. We hope you are enjoying watching Marigold as much as we are as well. Um, if you want to follow us on Twitter, as I've already mentioned, don't forget you can. It's at Marigold gold podcast uh, you can join the patreon patreon.com forward slash the stardom cast we can get all of these episodes ad free for as little as a dollar a month check out the website www.thestardomcast.com where you can also check out full marigold statistics and stardom year by year statistics as well as well as championship histories and the like they are all live on the website now so make sure to check them out you can talk to me on Twitter at, at Real Rob Goodwin. One final plea, if you wouldn't mind leaving us a podcast review, whether that is on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, which I don't even think is a thing anymore, CastBox, Spotify, Radio Republic, iHeartRadio, wherever, then uh, we are we are there. So it would be great if you could leave us a review. Matt Turner, sign us off. Good, sir. Absolutely, folks. Questions, comments, suggestions for anything that you would like to hear us to do on the Patreon or just in general, let me know. Matt Turner at OF on the Instagram and or the Twitter is the best way to get a hold of me. If you want to shoot me an email, perfectly fine as well. The Stardomcast22 at gmail.com is the best way to get a hold of me via the email system. Folks, that's going to wrap it up for another episode. We're really hoping that you're enjoying all the content that we are providing you both on the Marigold Standard Experience and the Stardom Cast. Uh, myself and Rob are doing the best we can trying to juggle certain schedules, and we're going to try to hopefully have something down uh, you know, as far as when the Marigold shows will come out. But uh, we really appreciate your support. Everything that we've been getting so far has been nothing but positive reviews. And speaking of positive reviews, like, like Rob said, go on to uh, whatever podcast catcher you have and leave us a five-star review and a comment really helps getting out these shows to the masses but uh yes we greatly appreciate greatly appreciate your support can't do it without you because like i always say it's just not my podcast it's our podcast because we're all together everybody's different everybody's special <laughs>